Again, let me thank you this morning for your presence here, and we certainly ask a continued interest in your prayers as we continue in the service this morning. I trust today that you will be in prayer not only for those who have been mentioned, but as I stand before you today, I certainly beg an interest in your prayers, and I pray that the Lord will bless us this day in his service. Um, my family and I want to thank you for this this last week for your cards, your calls, or whatever you may have thought, whether you called or not. We appreciate your kindness and thank you for helping us during the loss of our uh, loved ones. And I trust that the Lord will bless all of you and us together in a special way to understand that there's something far better than what this world has. And we are thankful that even though that we can say farewell to those that we love for so long and live for generations, that we can be in a special way assured that there's something far better in a place that is better than this world that is no friend to grace. This morning, Lord being my helper, I want to talk to you concerning the cities of refuge that are found in the Old Testament. Call your attention to Numbers chapter 35 and beginning with verse 14. And ye shall give three cities on this side of Jordan, and three cities shall ye give of the land of Canaan, which shall be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be a refuge both for the children of Israel and for the stranger and for the sojourner among them that everyone that killeth any person unawares may flee thither. Now that's Numbers chapter 35 verses 14 and 15. The cities of refuge. Will you pray with me once again just now? Heavenly Father, as we come again to thy throne of grace today, we realize that we are nothing and less than nothing, and that we stand again as a poor beggar at mercy's door. And as empty a vessel as we are this morning, Lord, we would pray that you would fill us up with a portion of thine unwasted fullness, and that we might bring forth something that would be beneficial to this congregation that would be here today, that it might lodge in their hearts to bring forth fruit to thy name, honor, and glory. We are thankful for each one that is here. We are thankful for those who have a desire to be here and cannot be. And we pray for those who are cold and indifferent to thy cause and kingdom here in the world. Father, we would ask you today to... Bless us all that we might be able to look unto thee who is the founder and perfecter of our faith and that as we look unto thee and walking by faith that we might divorce ourselves for a while from those things that would disturb us and set our affection on heaven and divine things. (coughs) Father, we are thankful that we have the opportunity to call thee our God, a God that rules and reigns heaven above and in earth beneath, whose will is done in the army of heaven and the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay thy hand, nor say, Why doest thou these things? Father, we are thankful for such a sovereign God as you are, and we pray today that in that great power that you would enable us in a special way to march on toward the mark and the prize and the high calling as it is in thee and thy son. Father, bless thy church and people wherever they've met together today. Those ministering servants that stand behind this sacred desk, would you fill them with uh, that ability to expound upon thy word and like good soldiers stand upon the watch walls of Zion to cry aloud and spare not. Father, we pray today for our nation, for the leaders of our nation. We would ask, Lord, in these days that trouble us that you would Give us godly men that we could have the expectation that they would look unto thee for wisdom and for help. And as we 
come to this hour this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to forget ourselves and that we together might be enabled to worship thee and what we trust will be spirit and in truth. Father, continue with us now. Accept our thanks for the blessings of life. When we come to the end of the way and we've prayed our last prayer, when we've sung our last song, when we've preached our last message, help us, Father, that in the, the things that we believe, may we pass off the stage of action in a triumphant state, knowing that thy promises are sure and the realities of yonder's world are real and certain, and that our expectation may become a reality when we awake with our likeness and are satisfied when we come to thy presence. We know, Lord, these are great blessings that we ask, but we know that you're a great and independent God. And what we fail in asking, we only trust that you will not fail in granting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I have your attention for just a little while this morning. I hope that you will... Remember this beginning point that I read to you this morning, and uh, in doing so that you might reflect on it as you would have opportunity to do so. Under the Old Testament, there were many, many varied rules that had to be adhered to in many, many special ways. For example, that if a person willfully committed a murderous act in taking a life premeditated, then the law required that he should surely be put to death. You can read that in the last verses of uh, the 35th chapter of the book of Numbers. And in that, the Bible tells us that the law required a eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, hand for a hand, and foot for a foot. That is verbatim what it says. That's what was required in that particular circumstance. But there was another circumstance to which the Lord referred to, and you'll find that written in the 19th chapter of the book of Numbers, or Deuteronomy. And this was when an accidental death occurred. And when that took place, then the Lord had provided three cities that were within the land of Canaan and three cities that were without the land of Canaan that were called cities of refuge. Now this was very important because if an accidental death occurred and uh, the family of the man that had died uh, were so disposed to do so that they could send what was called an avenger of blood. And that avenger of blood could uh, take the life of the individual and uh, the very essence of what was going on here was is that in the heat of anger the man might take another innocent life that was unnecessary. Now, these cities of refuge were given three on one side of the River Jordan and three over in the land of Canaan that the man that had committed what we would call manslaughter, that is unwillingly, a death, could flee to that city of refuge until the congregation could hear his case or he would come to a fair trial, as we might call it. And uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 19, he gives an instance about that, beginning with verse 4. And that is that if a man and his neighbor happened to be in the woods and they were hewing, or we'd call cutting wood, and an axe head came off the handle and struck him in the head and he died, that was called an accidental death. But in the heat of the anger of the death, some of the family might be disposed to put this man to death that had accidentally caused the death. 
But before that could take place, this man could flee to the nearest city of refuge, and there he could abide in protection and a shelter until he could have a fair hearing before the congregation of the children of Israel and the elders. Now, the Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 21, I believe it is, in Exodus chapter 21 and uh, beginning with uh, about verse 13, he tells us this, And if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then will I appoint unto thee a place whether he shall flee. Now, hope you understand what this is saying. That if a man did not premeditate a murder, and yet God in his providence delivered this man into the hand of another, and he died, then uh, the Bible says, I will appoint him a place whether he shall flee. All right, now, you can read about these cities of refuge and find all their names in the 20th chapter of the book of Joshua. Now, I'll not take time to go over there and read all of that, but I will give you the names of the six cities because it's very important that you understand the six cities and what they mean in the Hebrew language. The first one was Bezar. And the definition of that is strong. Ramoth Gilead, which means high power. Golan, which is the term that means fertile. Hebron, which means a gathering place. Shechem, which means shoulder. And Kadesh, which means a sacred place. So I hope that you can see that all of these cities that have names that are very important were given that these men might flee and have a resting place or a shelter from the avenger of blood. When you study about these are, it means strong. What more could one want in the day of an affliction like that other than a strong place to abide in? Ramoth Gilead the high tower or that high place where he could abide. Golan, the fertile place where the rivers ran and where flocks could graze and where herds could lie down. You'll understand the city of Golan was in the land of Bashan and it was a fertile land in that day. Shechem or Shoulder. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that I'll lay the key of David upon his shoulder. Kadesh, that sacred place, which surely had a place, uh, a reference to that place like Bethel, where Jacob met the Lord face to face. But here were these cities that they dwelled in. Here was that place to where the uh, man that had committed this uh, incident could go, and there he could find a shelter in the place uh, that he needed to find it. He could find something there that he could find nowhere else, because this was that that was appointed of God. Now, I've said all that to say this this morning, my friend, that this was not only given to the Israelites, but it's very important that you understand in verse 15 of our text, that these six cities shall be a refuge both to the children of Israel, number one, to the stranger, number two, and to the sojourner. Now, somebody said, well, preacher, what does that mean to me today? Why did that have a, a special significance? Well, the, the thing was that the Israelites, had an inheritance in those cities. Those were Levite cities that were uh, headed and controlled by the Levites, which was a priestly tribe. So the Israelites had an inheritance there, but not only did the Israelites have an inheritance there, but the stranger had an inheritance there. Now, 
A stranger was one that had no dwelling place. You know, the Bible tells us, and God made mention of it and reminded them in Deuteronomy 10 and 19, that you were a stranger in a strange land. Abraham was said to be a stranger in a strange land. And the point was that you had no inheritance there, had no relative nor kin. Sometimes we used to sing an old song out of our hymnal at home that was named The Lone Pilgrim. And this man evidently understood the difference uh, in an Israelite, a sojourner, and a stranger. And that old hymn writer said it like this. He said, I wandered an exile, a stranger from home, no kindred or relative not. You see what that means? That stranger had no kindred, and he had no relative. The sojourner was different. The sojourner had a relative where he could stay. The sojourner had a place and a shelter where he could abide. That's not so with a stranger. But whether this man was an Israelite, whether he was a sojourner, or whether he was a stranger, if this incident happened to him, he could rest assured that he had a place in the city of refuge. Now, when you understand that, then you can understand what the writer means here when he said in Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 27, he said that the eternal God is thy refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. Don't you like that? The eternal God is thy refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. Go with me to the book of Second Samuel. Remember uh, those uh, names that I gave to you about those cities? Remember the strong, the high tower. Listen to what David said about his God in Second Samuel chapter 22 and beginning with verse 2. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock. In Him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation and my high tower and my refuge. You see what he says here? My high tower and my refuge. Here's the city now that he talks about. Here's the high tower uh, and my refuge. Go with me to the uh, book of Psalms in Psalms chapter 9, beginning with verse 9. The Bible said, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed and a refuge in times of trouble. In Psalms chapter 46 and beginning with verse 1, He said, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. David could understand that as good as anybody could. I remember one time when he said it like this. He said, I am like uh, the owl in the desert. He said, I'm like uh, the pelican in the wilderness and like the sparrow alone on the housetop. How many times, friends, have you ever been just like that? How many times have you ever felt uh, in the midst of your affliction and your depression uh, that you're like the sparrow alone on the housetop? I'll tell you this, if you know anything about sparrows, you never see one by itself. It's always in a drove. They're never by themselves. But David said, I'm like the sparrow alone on the housetop. He said, I'm like the pelican uh, in the wilderness. You put that pelican in the wilderness and he'll starve to death because he's out of his habitat. But do you put him around the docks in the ocean? He's the best fisherman that they are. But he said, I'm like the uh, sparrow alone on the housetop. I'm like the owl in the desert, uh, the pelican in the wilderness, uh, and that sparrow alone on the housetop. David could understand that. You know what he asked one time uh, in his uh, despair and his affliction? He said, is the Lord clean gone forever? Uh, is His mercies departed from me? I'll tell you there are times in our lives and times in your life, no doubt, that you feel like sometimes 
uh, that you stand by yourself. I know there's been times in my life uh, when I have come to the place it seems like that I was a stranger uh, like that stranger in a strange land. Not a sojourner, but a stranger. Didn't have any uh, kindred or relative nigh. Like Abraham was a stranger uh, in a strange land. Uh, then there have been other times uh, that I felt like a sojourner uh, that I did have a place where I could shelter in time of a storm. Then there have been times when I felt like I had an inheritance uh, uh, like the Israelites uh, uh, in the land of Canaan. But I'll tell you right now uh, that in all of that, in every circumstance, my friend, uh, God has said that I will not forsake you, that I will never leave you alone because thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, uh, uh, I'll be with you. Uh, when the, uh, you pass through the fire, the flame will not kindle against you for thou art mine. I'll tell you, my friend, what the belongs to the Lord, He's going to care for because it's bought and paid for by Him. Yes, sir. That's the reason He says it like this. He said, you've got a city of refuge. I'll tell you, it's not in mother and daddy. Oh, as good as they are and as much as we'd like to have confidence in them, I'll tell you sometimes there's things that mother and daddy can't do. There are times that uh, children can help and there's times uh, that uh, we can uh, go to them and uh, ask for them. Or they can come to us and ask for things and we may be able to help them. But I'll tell you there's times when all the mothers and daddies and all the children can never do anything except God Himself be on the scene. Thank God today that we have a refuge. No wonder uh, Moses could say in his farewell address uh, that the eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. Underneath are the everlasting arms. Do you see what he says? I'll tell you, when this man went to the city of refuge there, they couldn't touch him. When this man went to the city of refuge, oh, there was a place there where he could stay and be unmolested until he come before the congregation. And I'll tell you today, my friends, oh, there's a place today that you and I have in this world when everything else has come to naught that we can flee to. And He's called the God of our rock. We can go to Him. He's promised to hear us and give us a shelter in time of storm. The Bible tells us, notice now what He says in Psalms chapter 62 and verse 8. Listen now to what He says. Psalms chapter 62 and verse 8, David says this, In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. Hear that? Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. David said here, In God is my salvation. Who did he say? In the preacher? No. In God is my salvation. In what I do? No, that's not it. In a decision that I made. No, that's not it. But in God is my salvation. Do you hear what he says? In God is my salvation. In God plus this? No, but in God is my salvation. I talked to a man not long ago. He said, Brother Ricky, that I believe in salvation by grace. But he said, the only one thing about it, he said, I think that I have got to receive it in order that it be made effective. Well, I said it like this, and I've said this before, and I've heard others say it, and I'll say it again. Brother, you can't receive something that's never been offered to you. You hear me? You can't receive something that's never been offered to you. When Jesus Christ died, He didn't offer Himself to you. He offered Himself to God. And God accepted that as a full and complete payment for sin. Uh, Jesus never offered Himself to you. Uh, you can't receive something that's never been offered to you. I maintain today that when Jesus offered Himself to God down on the cross and hung there and said, It is finished. Uh, he completed that work and uh, nothing can be added to it because a job that's done uh, needs nothing added to it in any way. 
Now my wife sitting back there, she can tell you around my house there's plenty that I leave undone. Y'all, amen? Y'all got some of that? You know, there have been things that I've been intending to do for years that I just never have got on. Uh, i got a lot of stuff that needs doing around. But you know, i got some important things to do. You know, i got I got more things to do in this than paint and do woodwork and things like that. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. You know, i got to go hunting or something like that, you know. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I, you know, there's they, they, they some things that come take priority, you know. That's right. The other morning, uh, I got up kind of early and I was going to go hunting a while. And, and uh, she said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to make a little trip. She said, yeah, I know the trip. <laughs> yeah, I know the trip. Well, she knew what I was doing, you know. You know, I've been married to her a long time. It's hard for me to pull much over. But I want to tell you something, brother. You can come to the house of God this morning. You can come to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you right now, you can find a refuge in this world that this world will never know anything about. There's a church in this world that is strong. Here is the place where you can find your high power. Here is the place where you can see the salvation of God. And in the true church is where you hear preach the finished work of Jesus Christ and the sovereignty of an all-wise God. I maintain today that when David said, In God is my salvation and my glory. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 6, listen now to how Paul deals with this. When he speaks like this, beginning with verse 17. He says, For men verily swear by the greater. And an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Now, if you'll read about this, you're going to find that we're coming to a time where Paul says that God swore to something. Now, what is it for God to swear? Now, listen to this. This is very important. What is it for God to swear? That is that God pledges all that He is to a promise that He made. Alright, now listen to it. He says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show to the heirs of promise the immutability of His counsel. That is, the unchangeableness of His mind. He says the immutability of His counsel, He confirmed it by an oath. Alright, now you've not only got His Word, but you've also got His oath. Now, I might come down here and I might look at some of you, brother, and I say, well, I say, I need some money. I said, I'm going to borrow $50 till I get back home, and uh, I'll send it to you when I get home. Well, you'd say, well, your word's good enough. I say, no, in addition to that, I'm going to write you out a note and sign it. You've not only got my word, but you've also got my oath right here. You see? All right? Now, he says this, that by two immutable things, two unchangeable things, that is, you've got His Word, but not only that, you've also got His oath. By two immutable things in which it is it was impossible for God to lie. Isn't that wonderful? You know, it's sad today, but men will tell a lie, won't they? Yeah, men will tell a lie. It don't hurt folks to tell a lie. Judge told me a while back, he said, You know, Brother Ricky, men will stand up and swear a lie on God's Word, and they'll do that. They'll do that. But I want to tell you today, the Bible tells me in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, he says this, For God, who cannot lie, promised eternal life before the world began. God, who cannot lie, by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, that we might have strong consolation, listen now, who have fled for refuge. Remember now the cities. Remember there what they said. 
They could go there for a place of shelter. They could go there for a place to escape the avenger of blood. Well, here's a place the Bible says that by these two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, that we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge uh, to lay hold on the hope that is set before us. See what he says back. Fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope that is set before us. Now, let me just give you this. If you lay hold on something that's not yours in Alabama and Georgia, you're liable to get in trouble about it. Alright? He said to lay hold on the hope that is set before us. I imagine primitive Baptists are misunderstood on the word hope as anything I know of. When we talk about hope, we're not talking about a dream. We're not talking about some kind of a wish. We're not talking about an hallucination. But we're talking about Christ. Christ is our hope. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.1 says, The Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. The mystery among the Gentiles, uh, in Colossians 1 and 23, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When we talk about hope, we're talking about the expectation of God who cannot lie, fulfilling a promise that He made before the foundation of the world. That's what we're talking about. Now, it's a settled fact. To know something must be a reality. Now, you know, I'm going home after a while, but you know, I don't know that I'm going to get that. I'm expecting to, but I don't know that. But when I walk up and sit down in that red chair, my hope won't be a hope anymore. It'll be a reality. Amen? Be a reality. Now, there are times in this life when all the devils in hell couldn't convince me that I wasn't a child of God. But there are other times when I get like David, I feel like the sparrow alone on the housetop, I feel like the owl in the desert, and I feel like the pelican in the wilderness, and I feel like that there's no hope for me in any degree in anything. But you know what I have to do then? I have to go to the city of refuge. I have to lay hold on something that I can't see. I have to, by faith, I'll lay hold on the hope oh, that is set before us. I never will forget. I think I told you this. I don't know. One day I was in the grocery store years ago, and there was a great man in there. He's dead and gone now. Uh, Brother E.U. Calvert. He is, he is a great man. He wasn't among our people, but he was at the Baptist churches there at home. And... And he's a great man in many ways, but he knew us, he knew our people. And uh, met him at the grocery store, and he said, Brother Ricky, we want you to come to Boaz tonight. And he said, we'd just like to have you come down and visit with us. He said, we're having a big program going on, we'd like you to be there. And uh, circumstances didn't permit me to go, and so uh, I, I told him, I said, Brother Calvin, I said, I'd love to go, but I said, I just, I just can't make it. I said, I'm, my schedule won't permit it. And I was depressed and feeling bad, had some problems in the church, and and I'd been depressed about it, and so I told him, I said, but uh, he said, well, he says, he said, isn't it wonderful that if we know that if we don't uh, see one another again, he said, isn't it wonderful that we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that we'll meet one another in heaven? Well, that was one of those days that I just wasn't so sure about. I said, well, Brother Calvin, I said, I tell you, I don't doubt for what you're a child of God, but I said... I see it in your life. I see the Spirit of God radiate from you. But I said, if I had to tell you right now that I knew that I'd meet you up yonder after a while, I said, I don't know whether I could or not. I said, but I hope I will. And he just come unglued. He said, man, you mean to tell me you pastor all these churches and bear all these folks and marry all these folks and you don't know you're going to heaven? I said, Brother Calvert, I said, right now, to tell you the truth, I can't tell you that to save my life. He said, man, if I didn't know that I was going to heaven, I'd never win another soul for the Lord. Well, he never had one one to start with. You see, that's where he's mistaken. Never won one to start with. I want you to understand, my friend, that the only soul that's ever been won, Jesus Christ won the soul. And I'm not expecting that to come true. I know that so. I believe in my faith. Yes, sir. 
he says, and I said, well, Brother Calvert, if you'll tell me how you know you can know, maybe I know how I can know. I said, how do you know? You tell me. He said, well, he said, I have accepted Christ as my personal Savior. And I answered all ways to that. I said, Brother Calvert, do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Christ has accepted you? He stood there for a minute. He said, well, no, but I hope he has. <laughs> you see, he didn't have any more than I had. You understand it? didn't have a bit more than I had. My friends, I want you to know today, as long as you live in this world, uh, there are times that you can reach your title clear to mansions in the sky. Oh, uh, there certainly is. But then there are other times when the darkness of night and the shades fall down as we find ourselves like David needing a city of refuge. Amen? I'll tell you today, Paul preached it like this. He said, by two immutable things... It was impossible for God to lie that we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope that is set before us. Listen now. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Whether the forerunner for us is entered... Even Jesus. You know, the forerunner. You hear that? You know, somebody would come up here and say, well, I'm a forerunner. You know, I'd be looking for somebody else, wouldn't you? I'll tell you right now. And he says, the forerunner uh, has entered for us. And I'll tell you, because Jesus Christ is the forerunner, because He has gone through uh, that very thing, you and I uh, have an entrance into heaven itself through the shed blood of our forerunner. We're not a stranger. We're not a sojourner. Uh, but we have a place of shelter. And that place of shelter uh, is God Almighty. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. You talk about surety. There it is. You talk about surety in the things of God. There it is. Don't you know that when that avenger of blood came and he could see, uh, and that man that was in the city of refuge could see him coming, why, he could understand and know that he can come to the gates of the city, but he'll never be able to take me out because I'm in the city of refuge. I'll tell you today, the enemy may pound at the gates, my friend. The enemy uh, may pound at the gates of your heart, but I want to tell you, he'll never gain an entrance there to take you away because the eternal God is your refuge. The eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. What a beautiful expression it is when we hear Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane when He began to pray. And His humanity began to bleed through there in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible says that Jesus went a little further, a little beyond and about a stone's cast. But as He knelt down in that garden just outside the walled city of Jerusalem. He began to pray, and this was what he prayed. Listen now. My friend, I want to tell you something. We have a city of refuge, but when Jesus prayed, He had no refuge. You hear? He had no refuge. When He prayed there in the garden of Gethsemane, and He said, Father, if it be possible. That bitter cup was placed to ascend his lips. And he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. My friends, Jesus Christ tasted the bitter cup of your sins. He tasted the dregs of the wrath of God. He had no place of refuge. God demanded uh, that justice be served. God demanded uh, that His uh, conditions be met. And the bitter cup, when it was placed to His sinless lips, uh, there uh, was bitter to His taste because the sins of you and me were there. But yet He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know, folks have the idea today that 
Jesus, when he died, just died with no purpose, that he died just hoping that what he did was going to work, that he died just hoping that what he did was going to be successful. Brothers and sisters, I want you to know today that what Jesus did was a complete and total success. The likelihood of failure was not involved. Because God, in His, in His uh, great purpose before the world began, has said uh, that thine are mine, and mine are thine, and I'm glorified in them. Read John chapter 17. Jesus said this, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And when Jesus died, the will of God was done. The will of God was done. There, as the heavy hand of the wrath of God fell on that suffering substitute, and the cry went up from this man that was there, crying out to his heavenly Father. Now listen, my friend. You and I have a refuge today. We can cry out to Him and He'll hear us because uh, we're an heir of the inheritance. Uh, we're not a stranger to Him. We're not a sojourner. But we're an heir and a joint heir with Him. But when Jesus cried out, He heard no answer. Listen to this. He said, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken me? You get it? Had no refuge. Had no refuge. We can say the eternal God is our refuge underneath of the everlasting arm, but Christ had no refuge. He must pay the penalty that God's law demanded. And I'll tell you, when he cried out in agony and pain, he dropped his head in the locks of his shoulder, and he died. That old centurion that stood there at the foot of the cross, you know what he says? When the rocks ran in the earthquake, he says, truly, this was the Son of God. Truly, this was Him. Truly, this was the one that Isaiah prophesied of. Truly, oh, this was the one that we looked for. Truly, this was Him. I'll tell you today, as they looked on Him, there that suffering substitute was that bore our sins. You see, there, my friends, is our refuge today. There is where we can flee. Several years ago, in Marshall County, Alabama, terrible storms came through. And as they came through, it devastated everything's path. And took tolls on lives. Homes were destroyed. And uh, near Alphaville, Alabama, there was a man that stood there on the porch of an old house, and everything he had gone, and held a little boy by the hand. His mother killed in a storm, children gone. And the little boy stood there and held his daddy's hand, and his daddy looked out across the devastation across the porch, and the little boy said, Daddy, how are we going to get along without Mama? Sister's gone. How are we going to get along? And they said he never did look down at the little boy, but he lifted up his eyes and said, Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. What a refuge that is. Amen? What a refuge we have today. When the doctors come and said we've done all we can do, what a refuge we have today. Uh, when uh, the uh, time has come and the straight line comes across uh, the screen, what a refuge we have today when we can come to the hour of death and know uh, that we can't have refuge in mother and daddy, the doctors, or anything else, but there's a place of refuge. Uh, the eternal God is our refuge. And underneath of the everlasting arms, listen to this today, Brothers and sisters, if you believe that today, I've got some good news for you. You don't need to be saved. You're already saved. You don't need to uh, have eternal life. You've already got eternal life. The reason you can believe it and believe it by faith is because something's already been done for you. 
Thank God today when we exercise that and taking up our cross and following Him, there is that blessing we have of coming to a city of refuge right now. A city of refuge that can be a home away from home. A city of refuge that can be something for us uh, in this world that is no friend of grace that this world cannot match. I'm thankful today that just as there were cities of refuge in that day, where that man could go and find shelter, there's a city of refuge for you today in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that shall never be destroyed. And in that today we can take courage because the eternal God is our refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. If you're here today, you love these things that we love. You come and we'll put your case before the church.